Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode 44. Today we're going to be talking about board game aesthetics or production values or art, or whatever you want to classify it as. Here with me today is Orion. Hello. And Matt. Yo, that was really non-committal there. What, non- to the topic? Yeah. Have yeah, I ever like committed all... to a topic? No, no. Yeah. That's fair. Why commit now? We'll it's, figure it's it out a, as we go. It's a brand new year. It's not a time to make commitments. What is this? Never change, Mark. Never change. Yeah. It's like, uh, oh, what was the character? What TV show was I watching? The character was like, her her goal was to, to not learn anything and never change. <laughs> I forget what show that was I was watching. The one you were just that... watching the other, like, yesterday? No, no. Oh, okay. It wasn't The Good Place, was it? I don't think I don't so. remember. I, it's completely gone out of my head. Anyways. Hey, l- last year, I said that my uh, New Year's resolution was to gain fewer than 15 pounds, which I met. Nice. Very nice. So, you know, if you're going to set goals, be, what is it, uh, team? Like, I, I forget the acronym. If you're going to set goals, make them manageable. That's what the M stands for. <laughs> <laughs> Smart goals, right? Smart, that's it, yeah. Specific, yeah, yeah. manageable, me- or measurable. No, it's not. It's measurable, right? That oh, sounds... I'm not good with acronyms. Yeah, and measurable goals are always good. The T is time-bound, and I forget the others. Yeah, I have never in my life made a New Year's resolution. Well, <laughs> I make them every maybe. year. I think it's, I like New Year's because it's like, it's a fresh start. It's a time to reevaluate where you're at, and think strategically big picture about long term what you're hoping to accomplish and what you did or didn't do last year and hopefully improve and learn and move on yeah i think i think for me it's a combination of i know i wouldn't be able to hold on to any goals and so i'd just be setting myself up for disappointment and also wanting to rebel against the arbitrary constraints of time we've developed as civilization (laughs) i mean yeah, I get that in a sense of like, we just pick, kind of picked this day as, you know, <laughs> this is the new year and there's no like cosmic event that says this is the new year, but we have decided upon an organizational system. Oh, sure. And I don't, I don't think setting goals is bad. I'm just saying it's a helpful delusion that I don't think I can do. Well, I'm still <laughs> helpfully deluded then. There you go. <laughs> anyway, so we're going to talk about board games. That look good or oh, that do not look good. good. Wait, what was that? I assumed uh, this that... was a hockey podcast. Oh, no. Gonna... Yeah, I thought we were going to talk about the Penguins winning streak. I wore my Penguins pajamas just so that we could talk about the Penguins. Oh, no. Did they actually win tonight? Uh, yes, they did. 7-2. to two. Wow. So that's um, now, what, was, seven in a row? A... Penguins are doing great. Yeah, seven in a row. Yeah, they're I looked fine. it up. I saw they're like fifth. Yeah, it's almost, it's mid-season. We're getting our act together, you know. There's your penguin update. <laughs> it's like both of your teams, the Seahawks and the Penguins, they just screw around the first half of the season and then finally figure out how to play in the second half every year. Yeah. Now, now my football team, on the other hand, <laughs> fell apart, missed the playoffs, and is now a circus. Yep. <laughs> I saw that. Yeah. Yeah, your, uh, your best player just didn't show up. Yeah, we thought he had an injury. Nope, he just was being punished for not showing up. <laughs> nice job. Well, he certainly wants to be traded, I assume. I mean, yeah, he, to be honest, like this year and next are probably their only hopes. Like Roethlisberger is going to get an old. Oh yeah, they get a yeah. they get a start. Oh, I mean, so they're doomed. But basically. by most, I think by most measures, this was Roethlisberger's best season as a passer. Was it? Yeah, he had, he had a pretty good year, I think. He hit 5,000 yards. I thought... Really? Wow. I thought people were saying that his arm strength was noticeably lower. Maybe they schemed around it, which is what, you know, a smart team would do. In other dumb quotes, uh, sports quotes of the day, the GM of the New York Giants said that having goals, or no, having priorities leads to making mistakes, especially with quarterbacks, and forcing it means you're more likely to make a mistake. In reference to what? In reference to Eli Manning still being an NFL quarterback, or so he claims, and not drafting a quarterback in the best QB draft in the last decade. Huh. 
because Saquon is a generational running back. He did do well, but still. He is really good, but, I mean, for fantasy, he's incredible. But in terms of organizationally winning, a quarterback is crushes every other important. position in importance. True, yes. Well, my team is, we we lost as was expected because our quarterback got injured, so I didn't really pay attention. Jimmy G. Yeah, well, we'll see if they're any good next year, I guess. We're going to get some good draft picks again. Maybe their defense will get better. Anyways, that's the sport update. I haven't been paying attention to sports at all. I guess, you know, once the playoffs start, I'll pay attention to football again. Yeah. It's, th- we're in that gulf where fantasy stopped mm-hmm. and the actual playoffs haven't started. Yep. And half the games don't matter. Yep. Anyways, let's talk about some board games. <laughs> Unless there's more Penguins talk you want to get out of your system, Matt. I'll, I'll save it for next time. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll bench it for next time. So the idea was to talk about games where the aesthetics of the games actually change our valuation of the game. And that kind of was the specific impetus for this podcast topic because I was thinking about it and... I think we prioritize the aesthetics of a game far less than a lot of people who talk about games. I look at other reviews and watch other reviews and see how other board game people talk about games. And for many people, the aesthetics of it is a massive part of the experience. And it really, really affects how much they like the game or dislike the game. For me, I don't think it's that important. And so I thought, okay, as an exercise I sat down one day, are there any games where the look of the game, the production values, actually affect how I perceive the game? In other words, if those production values drifted towards the mean, you know, one way or the other, would my rating of the game change? And I think there are a few where that's true in in a noticeable way. So that was my idea to use that question as kind of a springboard to talking about, yeah, the production of a game. And I want to, I don't want to say just the art. I'm talking about the whole production of it, the physical, like, design, the graphic design, the art, the component quality, all of that good stuff. You do include graphic design in this. Uh, yeah, I would. I would include that specifically for a couple of the things on my list. The graphic design is a big part of why I, I really think it's why it, it affects how I would rate it. For example, looking kind of giving a bit of a spoiler, there's definitely we're definitely going to be talking about Ryan Lockett games. And I think there are some games where the, he did the graphic design. All, his art's always incredible. I think some games he did the graphic design better than others, and those I, I I think I noticed that difference in how I perceive the game as a whole. So, do you guys want to just jump into talking about some specific games? I suppose we could start with Ryan Lockett. Yeah, I guess I have a lot of I don't know. I think there I I think there are a lot of interesting tangents to this topic, but I think the best way to find them might be just to start talking about games. Yeah, let's just so, start talking about games. So I'm looking at let's the list. In. I'm looking at the list we made here in our document, and Orion didn't have any Lockett games on his, but you and I chose the same one. Oh no, you put two of them down. Two of the three that we own. So you put down above and below and near and far. I only put down above and below. I think the aesthetics and the style of that game just by a hair, improve the quality of it more than Near and Far, just because it feels more cohesive. Near and Far had a bunch of different uh, yeah. landscapes, yeah. types, as you travel through. And while they're cohesive in that, you can look at them and say, oh, that's Ryan Lockett. They didn't create as much of like a cohesive world to me as Above and Below, which is specifically about one location type. Uh, which, if I remember correctly, at least through some kind of Easter egg, is kind of hinted at as the same world as Near and Far. I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up tying all of his games in at some point to some kind of meta universe, because he does use kind of the same little, you know, species of creatures in all yeah. of them, at least all the ones I've seen. I'm going to agree with your initial statement of um, the the production value, the aesthetics of Above and Below, even the graphic design is more of a boon to that game than in the case of Near and Far. We've talked about both games, and I think we share the different opinions about them. 
I just I enjoy Above and Below more overall. Just as far as like the artwork to look at it, the world, the style of art, they're very similar. But I think I think that that the style, the the whole package of of the production elevates both games. It's elevating it from different places, so it kind of functions differently. In in Above and Below, it really creates it, would you call it a, a lightweight euro medium to light medium to light euro with heavy story randomness maybe something like right. that that's that's a dangerous place to be as a game i think if if you pitched that to me before i saw anything i would be very hesitant to to say that that was going to be a good game um but the the production and the art and 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 the story narrative bits um, I'm not sure if you're you're including that in this discussion, um, but all those things tie the package together into something that is quite enjoyable and pleasant and fun to sit down uh, and play. Um, well, I I think, and you kind of hinted at this, is that they end up selling the the idea of the game, the idea of the yeah, game itself, yeah. which is that you're gonna on a mechanical level try to blend in these worker placement euro ideas with a large chunk chunk of randomness in exploration is a tough sell mechanically and certainly doesn't work out perfectly i don't think it can right those are kind of you know that level of randomness is is kind of opposed to euro design but given the art and given how much it sells you on the world on the setting it kind of bridges that and allows those two things to work better than they would have otherwise. Yeah. One thing that's maybe telling here is when we finish a game of above and below, well, first of all, when we finish any game, we tend to debrief. That's, that's probably the reason we started this podcast is because we love finishing a game and then dissecting what just happened. But when we finish above and below, we'll frequently point out the, yeah, I, you know, I got th- this story bit and I ended up not getting the thing I needed to score the most points. We'll point that out. But we're so focused on the 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 little narrative and which characters we ended up bringing on our team and stuff like that, that that production just kind of takes all our quibbles and, and numbs them a little bit. And that right. elevates the game. Another example where I think a game kind of does something similar is another two games on my list, the Forbidden series of Forbidden Desert and Forbidden Sky, where yeah. I think they are solid co-op games that sell the setting incredibly well. So with Forbidden Desert, with uh, the way the sandstorm looks on the table and how it's manipulated on a basic grid, the little flying machine, in Forbidden Sky, this kind of above the clouds electrical storm setting with magnetic bits and pieces that you're trying to connect it to a circuit those touches that don't need to be in those games sell the setting well enough that you are able to overlook in forbidden desert i think uh, just the amount of randomness that's there that can be very frustrating especially at higher difficulty levels in forbidden skies you know i've only played it once but its weakness might be that it's too reliant on very intricate planning. But I think given just how fun it is to play with the pieces of those games, it, it again patches over where we might find mechanical faults. There are some games where cubes would not improve the game. <laughs> a, f- a couple. Like those two in, sp- yeah. in particular. <laughs> yeah, I do absolutely. love cubes. <laughs> Very much. Yeah, no, you could very easily imagine Forbidden Desert with just little plastic orange cubes to represent the sand. Yeah. And it would not be as good. Yeah. No. Or no, without the I little think... the little pieces of the flying machine. Yeah, exactly. Right? Those are just different colored cubes. Yeah, they wouldn't sell the setting as well. That's not necessarily true of all games. Like, I'm thinking, sorry, Matt, I'm going to bring it up, but Mage Knight, like, if that didn't have the minis and had standees or something for the characters probably wouldn't make much of a difference with me. You know, if the city pieces weren't 3d sculpts, they were something else. I Haven't still we probably that enjoy the game be about better the as same. a computer game. People have said that I, I, it would probably work out pretty well as a computer game, but 
I do enjoy the tabletop experience there. But I, I think there's specific games where really kind of toy bits to the game that are more yeah. ornate than they need to well, be to improve in, the experience. In Mage Knight's case, they they reskinned the game to Star Trek, didn't they? Yes. Yeah, and we haven't played that version, but no, I think your comments and you know just the fact that they just rethemed it kind of speaks to that. I think the joy of the game isn't in being drawn in by the the production. It, it's in you know the card play, the planning, all that stuff that I think is fine and you you adore. I totally agree on Mage Knight. I think that that game doesn't need a particular production to be what it is. This reminds me of our uh, dankness scale that we talked about (laughs) uh, several months ago. And in our kind of pre-discussions leading up to that, I had kind of proposed the idea of a dry game being opposed with a game that makes you want to roleplay as opposed to look for efficiencies. And we kind of went back and forth and we discussed that idea. But in terms of this case where we're talking somewhat overlapping, but maybe a bit more broadly about design rather than specifically theme, I don't know. I think some of those same sort of ideas apply of Above and Below is a game that if it was just, I mean, it is a lot of cubes, but if it was just cubes and action points, it would not be as enjoyable and it would not have the staying power that it does. Because so much of it is about this, the stories and the artwork and how that all works together to create this experience. Yeah, the, I, I was thinking exactly that when we were talking about Above and Below. I think that's a great example where because it sells the story and the setting so well, if you do something fun like go adventuring and it doesn't turn out very well for you in terms of victory points or resources or, or whatever, it doesn't feel as bad as it would. Not right. even close. Right, right, right. It's still, and, it's still and, fun. And you don't mind doing things like exploring every round <laughs> or something. Right. Even though the optimizational part of our brains is like, no, clearly you need to buy buildings and collect resources and, and explore <laughs> a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but exploring is so much of the fun of that game and just experiencing it rather than trying to optimize. Yeah. Jumping back to touch on near and far real quick, I think w- with that game, I just mechanically, I, I think it's it's not I don't think it's very good. And, and we uh, we don't need to dive into all the details of, of why we think that. But the same kind of narrative feel, the the beautiful map that you're playing on. Again, the characters that you're hiring and then physically putting in your little team queue, those things all elevate it to something that is enjoyable. All in all, I like it less than Above and Below, but I think still in the same way, the beautiful art, that beautiful map book, all the other pieces do draw you in and make it something more than it would be. Yeah, I completely agree. In Near and Far's case, I think for me... And again, I haven't played it in a very long time because I burned out on it very quickly. It makes me want to like the game more than I eventually did. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. In the comments here, uh, Mark mentions that the toy factor is pretty much the business strategy, strategy of Simon. And while, I, you know, again, in Forbidden Desert and Forbidden Sky, the toyness of it. I think really elevates those games. One of the games I had on my list of games where the aesthetics actually decrease my enjoyment of it is Rising Sun. We talked about this before, but just because you have big, intricate miniatures, and maybe you enjoy the miniatures in and of themselves because they are well done in terms of being an intricate, detailed sculpture, for me, at least with that big Kickstarter version we played with, with Rising Sun, the aesthetics of the game were just completely overwhelming in terms of visual impact, right? It's like it's like a movie where where the action scene is just throwing everything at you in rapid succession where you lose all sense of momentum or space or visual understanding and it's just trying to overload your system. That's kind of what Rising Sun was to me, where you had these giant minis that couldn't even fit on the big cloth mat board 
that they were using or whatever the material was. The minis didn't associate with the strength of the monster. All the colors were very vibrant, but there was so much detail on the map that it, it was still difficult to kind of pick out uh, the different areas of the border where things were. All of that combined to a very unpleasant aesthetic experience to me, even though each individual part does look very good, and it's obviously very well produced in terms of detail. As a whole, it completely failed for me. And I, I think I'd like to contrast that with something that showed up on at least a couple of our lists in some of the Lacerda games, where... I, I initially I was going to put this in the good section and then I moved it a couple lines down because I wanted to kind of compare and contrast it, not just say this is great, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, we've already done with all of his games. <laughs> but in terms of the design, I think when you look at a Lacerda game, it's overwhelming and messy and incredibly difficult to parse mm -hmm. and it doesn't make sense. And then you play it and maybe about three quarters of the way through your the first game or maybe into the second game you start to appreciate the design and all the symbolism and the information that they packed into the board and you really i don't yeah you you appreciate the design and and how everything is laid out for you and it's organized in a way that really supports the player uh, making the decisions in the game. Yeah, I mean, I remember when we first played Lisboa, which I think is, from a visual standpoint, ends up being brilliantly done. For half the game, it was just too much for me. It was a very similar thing to the Rising Sun experience. In that case, my, my perception of it changed during that first game, where all of a sudden, oh, that's there for this reason, that makes great visual sense that's reminding me of this thing that makes this one element really elegant you know visually and mechanically in that game i think in that one particularly the gallerist is very good as well it all it, the gallerist also has the all that cool original art uh for it i think the venus visual design isn't quite as good as either of those two although it's still got the nice you know thick chunky cardboard and all that i don't think it's quite as good to look at and quite as elegant visually as the Gallerist or Lisboa. But once you kind of are in the flow of the game, the visuals end up not only just looking attractive, but they help you play the game and understand the game's systems really nicely. And I think it's primarily around how well they're organized and how well they communicate information once you understand the game a little bit yeah and you know that's always the case in kind of heavy euro games that are trying to be language independent is that they use a lot of the iconography i think in lisboa in particular i think it does more than that on top of just having good iconography the board kind of shows you where things matter so you have the part with the nobles where the cards go and the was the influence tracker underneath that and those two things are related. You have the economy and the little priest guy who marches around in the middle because those are kind of connected to multiple things. Mm -hmm. And then you have on the right side of the board, you have the where all the rubble is and where you're rebuilding the city next to where you get the pieces to do that. Everything kind of flows visually and things that are related to each other are next to each other. Information that you would want to see and compare to other information is you know, easy, you know, right next to each other, easy to look at, all of that good stuff. Yeah, and I think all of that is really true. Really subtle ways, it's nice. Oh, for sure. And I think you keep, you realize more of that every time you play. And, of course, we love the thick cardboard in all the Lacerda games. Yeah, it's yeah, so nice. the, it's, it's, that's very much a gamer thing, where, like, <laughs> it's, you don't realize how nice it is until you actually are playing Mm -hmm. with the pieces and they have like the double thick cardboard and you're yeah. like yes this I, i'm i'm sold now mark's all, salivating over all, here. all games need to have the very thick cardboard pieces <laughs> anyways but i wouldn't call lisboa beautiful i think it is elegant and i can appreciate the design for all the thought that went into it and how well it's organized and how good it how well it communicates information but I don't look at it and say, that's a beautiful game. Not and on maybe first it's, Maybe glance. that's kind of the art style. It it's could be. It's kind of like a scratchy art style. I mean, of the three, the gallerist is probably the most attractive at first glance. 
Well, it also has like 40 commissioned paintings. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, that one is definitely a cleaner design overall. Yes. Um, but let's take that and compare it to maybe Viticulture or any of the either of the Stonemaier games that mm-hmm. uh, we've played significantly where the game is so attractive just like in how it looks and yeah. the art and well in the everything. case of Scythe the game created based on based art. on the art <laughs> yeah but even just the backgrounds in all the cards yeah. or pictures well, the spoilers really grown on to me but I do understand your your point and I don't think I mean I love Lisboa yeah but I think if we're talking about it in terms of aesthetic viticulture or scythe especially come out just hands down ahead they're very good yeah i I can see what you mean there have you seen the the uh the new stonemeyer game coming out the bird one no oh yeah it's it looks good it looks very pretty it was birds is that because you like birds so much i do like birds a lot and this one has it's just someone else's opinion about this all right mark i need a percentage breakdown of how much of your love for Lisboa is based on the artwork and how much of your expected love for the upcoming Stonemeyer bird game is based on the birds <laughs> um i think if Lisboa had the production quality of Kanban it might it would probably be my least favorite Lacerda game okay um at least by now you know after two or three plays the amount that I am excited for Wingspan, the new bird game from Stonemeyer, is almost entirely because of birds. <laughs> All right. No, and, and it's Stonemeyer. It looks great, and and uh, yeah, the Stonemeyer the is doing a fantastic job stuff. producing their games. Yeah, uh, but I'm excited about birds. Yeah. Well, I mean, the last Stonemeyer game we played, Charterstone, I was not a big fan of. So it had kind of the white box, though. You love white. It had a decent look. I think Tokaido does that white kind of pastel look a lot better mm-hmm. than even Charterstone did. But again, that Fog of Love does I it didn't... even better than that. What's that? Fog of Love does it even better than that. Fog of Love. That's one. Well, let's talk. Looking down at my list, let's talk about some games that do that clean style really nicely. Kind of the minimalist. Tokaido, you have that a bit. Fog of Love, you certainly have that. Deep Sea Adventures, one we played recently, that has a very, very clean, minimalist look that is just lovely. I really, really like it. But that the game is also tiny. Like, it fits in, it fits in a box of cards. Yeah, but it doesn't have to. Like, look at, I mean, look Deep- at Hanami Koji. That doesn't have that a clean look. It has a beautiful art style, but it doesn't have that kind of minimalist aesthetic to it. I just like Deep Sea Adventure is interesting because there's there's barely any board. Like what you're focusing on are just these cardboard bubbles that you you know place down down in the ocean. Uh, it's just like a line of bubbles that you can, you can actually place them in whatever you know configuration you feel like. That's one of the cool things about it, right? You can you have a part in making Deep Sea Adventure look nice on the table. Because yeah, the board, yeah. quote unquote, is freeform little chits, which is cool. Yeah, it's it's unique. Well, I don't know. I don't know if I'm with you on this deep sea adventure thing, but another minimalist game I would put out there is uh, Saikatsu, yes. which also has incredible components with those thick like dice tiles that barely missed my ten top ten list. But I mean, yeah, we we you know we talked with the designer recently, and he was very pleased by the the material the tiles were made out of, and I completely agree. In fact, going back to Rising Sun, the best part of that Rising Sun, you know, deluxe Kickstarter version were the tiles made out of, I presume, the same material. That material looks very nice. It's like the domino material. Mm -hmm. And Seikatsu works really, really nicely because, in part because of of the, the tiles being that material. They make a nice sound when they hit each other, you know, in the bag, the grab bag that you're drawing out of. Uh, I love mystery bags. And we were playing Dominant Species last night, and I realized that, you know, the Dominant Species, it's just little thin pieces of cardboard in their mystery bag, and it doesn't doesn't feel as nice, and it doesn't sound as nice when you just kind of stick your hand in there and rummage. I want the, I want the rummage experience. Seikatsu is, is the best at that, I think. I, I very much like mystery bags. But it, it does do that very clean white uh, white background very nicely. Tokaido, again... And then Fog of Love, you know, it has the white 
background pastel, in this case, kind of baby blue, baby pink colors very, very well. It also does what I th- think we were talking about with games like Above and Below in that it sells kind of a cohesive setting. I don't know what the setting is. I don't setting is the wrong word for fog of love. It sells a cohesive look, which is almost like Apple Store future clean, but Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, it's almost a very very futuristic uh, so just the style. The theme is an interesting thing to, to draw you into. I mean, it's trying to draw you into a relationship that spans a lifetime. Mm-hmm. Well, none, depending on the scenario. Yeah, more or less. That's a very different challenge for, a, you know, the production than, you know, a fantasy setting, a sci-fi setting, etc. Mm-hmm. With Fog of Love, it's an interesting choice because with a romantic setting, you can go kind of two ways. You can do that kind of clean, sleek style or you could go super homey with it, I think. I don't know necessarily what that would look like, but at least visually in movies, those kind of tend to be the the two styles you go with on romance. It's either like the young people, you know, young business person in the modern city wearing their suits and, right. their, and their business attire, or it's like out in the country somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, Fagelva does it really well. Going to clean games clean looking games in a different way when i was making my i wanted to narrow it down to 10 games that i think are where the aesthetics affect my opinion of it the most and one that surprised me that kept holding on was go um but thinking about it if if go didn't hadn't developed into that very clean eastern black on white look even even if it had still you know been one of the oldest games and super complex and interesting strategically if it didn't look like that i don't know if i would be as interested in playing it at all i think the look gives it a kind of mystique that that pulls me in so is that a game where you are more attracted to the aesthetic than the strategy I think the aesthetic goes hand in hand with the mystique of the game, of it being like the ultimate abstract game, you know, with the most history and it's more complicated than chess and yeah, all of it combined. Like, I don't think chess looks great necessarily. Obviously, you can have very fancy chess boards and everything. But I mean, if chess wasn't chess, if it wasn't the strategy game that you learn when you're a kid at some point, I wouldn't have any interest in it. For Go, it's the combination of the history of it and the aesthetic that really pull me in to wanting to know more about it. I think yeah, chess... ab- abstracts are interesting because you can you can reskin an abstract so easily. Like even as as you bring up Go, the image I have of Go is that black and white, but on like a poorly drawn computer screen, black and white. Oh, really? Yeah. Now, I, I, I've also seen a Go board that's, you know, beautiful, actual stone. But I think it, I, I was thinking about abstracts a little bit. I played Tack once over the, the Christmas break, um, which has nice wooden pieces. At least my copy does. The aesthetics are nice, but it's almost as if, if, I, if I like the game enough, then I can spend some effort to get the aesthetics that I want. That's certainly the, the case with chess. I think, yeah. you know, the, the times I've been more interested in chess, I have, you know, just browsed some, you know, chess boards that, that have one of three or four different styles that I find very attractive. I will say that it is much nicer to play chess with some nice, like, solid pieces than with mm. the stupid, like, plastic travel set that you had in as a child or the one that's sitting over in the living room right now that's that's very poor yeah exactly <laughs> like that <laughs> yeah i don't like that set at all we had a nicer one growing up that had actually weight to the pieces it's really the weight yeah. to the pieces and go it's like the the solidness of the piece like you have to like it adds it. gravity to the situation yeah yeah it's literally adds weight in more ways than one to playing the game yeah I don't know, that was an interesting one to me, because I was thinking, man, if Go 
didn't have that look, I don't think I'd be nearly as interested in, in playing it or learning more about it or figuring out the strategy, which is something that I will hopefully be doing sometime this month. Uh, I, did, I hadn't mentioned it Spoilers. Of- officially yet. I guess I'll mention it now. Well, before this podcast goes out, I will have something up on the website, but this month will be focused on abstract games, not exclusively. But each month in 2019, we're going to have a theme, and I decided abstract games will be the theme for January. Sneak peek for those uh, Patreons who are watching right now. Well, they already know about it. I told them all about that already. But All the more reason to join the Patreon, Mark, <laughs> and yes, the Discord. Exactly. Okay, so let's just like step back. And sure. As, as we've been talking, I'm kind of getting a sense of three different broad categories. If we had to like bucket all the games we've talked about into three different categories i would say Ooh. one Love bucketing bucketing yeah yeah right for charting and graph it's great stuff do you do you like buckets or cubes more i mean cubes but in this sense <laughs> cubes are meaningless so we're gonna go with bucketing all right you could have a cubic bucket <laughs> could do cube. you also need like a holographic projector to view it properly could take our buckets and cube them It'll have nine distinct things. Never mind, go ahead. Sure. All right, so we're just going to no. go with the simple three-bucket breakdown. All right? So the first bucket, which for you would include Rising Sun, is games where the aesthetic actively gets in the way of playing the game. Sure, yeah. Okay? I'll have t- I have two other examples of that we'll get to. Okay, and we can come back to this. And then the, ne- the next bucket is games that are either neutral or the aesthetic is nice but doesn't get in the way it's 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 there and maybe it improves your experience of you're like oh that game looks nice but it's like it's just kind of there Mm -hmm. and then i think there's games like let's say fog of love or uh, above and below where the aesthetic becomes a significant part of the game and the experience and it sells this holistic feat of design really and creates a whole a whole world for you to step into for an hour or several hours whatever the game may be and just kind of to frame our discussion looking at three different broad yeah categorizations of how the aesthetic might impact playing of the game yeah, and I okay, think within counter, the positive point. bucket I think you could sub bucket it is that what it's called <laughs> Because bucketing's a programming thing, right? It's no, it's a data analysis no. thing for like ch- charts analysis. and data and stuff. Okay, whatever. I'm gonna call it sub bucketing. I think at least looking again, I'm looking at the list I created. You can almost separate the positive ones into two categories. First, games that sell their setting or their theme or their narrative very well, which is mostly what we've been talking about, and games where the production and the art and the look of it just make it more fun which we haven't talked about quite as much but the main example i would give to that is to zulkin where i'm not bought into to zulkin on and a I, narrative okay. level okay i think i would put that in the center bucket where the design is there and it might be good or it might be neutral but it's not it doesn't sell the game does that make sense it doesn't sell like the... Tzolkin is a good strategy game, even if it didn't have cool gears. And the cool gears are like, oh, that's extra fun. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's but, but let's it, translate. But the... imagine if Tzolkin, you just kind of manually move things along the track each round, like you just kind of shifted everything over. I don't think anyone would remember it particularly well. I don't. I think it would have gone mostly unnoticed. Okay. Right. I don't think I would have very much fun with it. Or as much fun with it. I think, okay, that's a nice Euro game. With the gears and with the look of it and the way that the rotation kind of influences your way of thinking, I think it. Be, I think I rate it higher because of the production value by a good chunk. I, I think that, actually, I'm not sure if I'm agreeing or disagreeing with your sub buckets, Mark, but but with Tzolkin, the the gears and all that stuff actually makes the playing so much more comprehensible i can't even ma- imagine the mechanics of tzolkin without those gears uh, it might be impossible well if you just um, had to physically like you know there are five tracks or whatever in every right. round you just shift the your pieces over one manually yeah. 
So, yeah, yeah, that that would work. That would work. It would work, but, but I don't think it'd be an interesting or memorable game as much as it is by a no, good, good margin. No, but I guess I... I I guess I would put those more with the like L- even Lacerda games of once you kind of understand once the mechanics click you realize how how well presented they are on the game yeah. board. Well, that might just be a category of Euro games that do Euro game things really really beautifully and well, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> a lot of it's just very clear iconography. And the board flows like we were talking about with Lisboa, and the pieces feel nice, and the art isn't dull. Like think of like uh, like um, what's that one? Kalamala. There's a Euro yeah. game that looks okay and does what it does, right? But it doesn't do anything exceptionally visually like these games. Uh, these games do that dry Euro thing, but just on a completely different level where it's very nice. But I, I think the main thrust of the aesthetic is in service to the mechanisms oh sure yeah maybe that's the distinction and i'm trying to distinguish that from something like above and below where it's about the storytelling yeah i I understand so in that sense i'm putting things like lisboa in the center bucket yeah sure that makes sense to uh to to further derail your bucketing oh we have buckets within buckets here well here's some other buckets are they russian buckets on it's a buckets different all the axis. way down. It's um, like, have you seen the, to Zulkin. Have you seen the video? Like, it's like an old when we were in high school, like internet video of the guy who's running around somewhere with a bucket on his head, and there's a cop chasing him, and he pulls the bucket off, and there's just another bucket underneath. No, I have not. <laughs> You've seen never this. seen this. No. <laughs> it's it's an old school GIF, GIF, right. whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Anyway, go. Matt Sorry, Matt. Say something intelligent. Yeah. No, I, I, I've no, ruined I all the intelligence. To be bucket in Buckethead. <laughs> if you look up Buckethead, you might find the very talented oh, guitarist. <laughs> yeah. Who is something else entirely. Maybe that's who was no, running I, I, along the street. I found the, the video. He's running on top of the cart, and then that's he gets right. punched by a cop, and and the bucket comes up, and there's another bucket underneath. It's it's beautiful. Yeah, what I was going to say, a game like Tzolkin kind of has these great mechanics and then found a theme that just so happens to perfectly fit with it. It's like it's it's almost like too coincidental that like Mayan calendar gears just works perfectly with with the mechanics of Tzolkin. I don't know that that kind of feels different to me than like the near and far thing where the 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 theming and, and all that is kind of a more independent thing like it just like it, it's that that whimsical world that's created is something that's great in and of itself am i making sense yeah yeah I, I think we're all on the same page here but ryan's categories of correct me if this is if, if this isn't what you're saying oh, no, I was, but I was games to, where to derail that conversation of ryan's categories i don't think it does derail games well, there's i mean two, you, you're free categories. to take off the bucket there might be another one there who knows but we, we there's only one way to find out Games where the aesthetics sell the setting or the story or the feeling of the game very, very well. And then games where they just simply have excellent aesthetics that make the game more fun to play. Okay. Yeah. Is that is that close to what you were saying? I don't know. I, I think, think I'm maybe I think I took to, too many yeah, levels of buckets off like and that. then I just ended back where I started. Just recursive bucket? That's not recursive. That's, uh, I don't know. Cyclic bucketing. C- yes. Yeah, cyclical. It's a cyclical. cyclical bucket, just like a tire, like a donut. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Gosh, it's, why are we podcasting so late, guys? <laughs> this this kind of things happens. This does remind me of my new favorite mythological beast, the recursive centaur. Oh, yes. Explain that one again. It's wonderful. Oh. Yes. Half horse, half recursive centaur. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best i love it i saw it retweeted on on twitter uh you got you got to go look up the picture of it it's phenomenal it delightful yeah i think we hit a lot of broad categories do we want to run over our lists real quick yeah or let's rather, do that let's, let's run through our lists and then i would lists. like to talk about games where the aesthetics actively harm our experience and make the game 
very much worse than what it could be. Because I have a list of five. So if, if you took the game and just replaced everything with like gray cubes or something, that would be an improvement over maybe the colorful design or whatever. And I'm not trying to well, denigrate cubes. I'm just saying no, not gray necessarily. Is a color. Not ne- well, yeah. In some cases, maybe in a couple cases, if they just had like I have two games where if the art was just like good, it would. All be, right. Anyways, yeah, we'll get anyway. there. Go ahead, just Matt, go through your list. Why don't you? What's your list? Okay, so I did not order these. These were just games that I thought of. Yeah, above and below, near and far. We talked about those. Yeah, Fog of Love, we also talked about, but I think that that could have gone horribly wrong. But the presentation is just so good in so many ways. And I still don't know what I think of the game, but it's like, it's a game you have to play, you have to experience. I think I've only played it three times, but they were awesome experiences. And it's completely sold by by the look of the board, um, just how clean it is, as, as you said, Mark. Moving on, I was I was interested in Mysterium, and there are probably other games that you could similarly talk about, where the game is mostly aesthetics. Yeah, I think like, that's an interesting one, because the theme doesn't really make sense. It's like, you're these mediums who are contacting a ghost who saw murder, but it just like doesn't really work. It doesn't make a lot of yeah, sense. Yeah, like there's and some weird the, story and the mechanics are that s- kind of holds it all together but really it literally it's just makes this no kind sense of sur- it's like a surreal murder mystery and the story doesn't really matter because it's all about these pieces of art that the ghost player is silently giving to people mm-hmm. yeah the mechanics aren't really anything crazy and it's not like a deep strategy game it's all about that well <laughs> to go back to another recent pod or not recent but past podcast the hidden hindered in communication mm-hmm. where you're trying to get someone else to understand what you're thinking with this yeah. very in this case surreal paintings dreamscapes yeah yeah well and that one is so, it it works because the art in it is suitably vague and open to interpretation yeah and also simultaneously very nice to look at so yeah that one didn't quite make my list just because i think a lot of at least in the english version i don't know about the original polish one or whatever the some of the stuff seems like they're trying just a little too hard with like the crows and the clock thing and it's like yeah it could have been a much smaller more streamlined package and in have been easier i think to to get set up and play and less annoying to fiddle with sure sure i don't know i think still the the like the the actual content of what you're doing is 90 percent the quality of the pictures and stuff like that i i think it's interesting to contrast that with similar games so like for example codenames pictures is probably a better game not as good as regular codenames but i think codename pictures is still a good game but i'm not as drawn in by that art it's just very plain, sketchy. It's all line drawings, uh, right? Yeah. And there's a certain theme there or motif or something where each line drawing is simultaneously two different things, which which is cool. And it's interesting. And I have enjoyed playing it actually more than I thought I was going to enjoy playing it. But still, the experience is so reliant on the actual art. I would rather play Mysterium, whether or not it's a better game or not. Mm-hmm. Uh, real quick, Scythe. Did we talk about Scythe? Briefly. For me, Scythe is an interesting one because I don't I don't know if the the aesthetics, the production actually matches the mechanics. As uh, I don't know. It's just super fun. It's just super fun, pleasing. It feels cool, even though the mechs you're using. You're not using as much as maybe you feel like you should. It just, it it all works for me. It was mentioned in the chat that a lot of people were frustrated by Scythe because it seemed like more of a war game than it was. And I understand that. It doesn't bother me that much. But I don't feel the cohesiveness of of the setting and the art and the mechanisms. Maybe this is one that we put in kind of a middling category. That said, Um, it's very nice to look at. It's very nice. Yeah, yeah, this is a case where the art is beautiful and the production is incredible, but it's not exactly cohesive with the mechanics. It's almost the opposite thing of Above and Below, right? It doesn't. You have a you you have a game where the mechanics are interesting and you have the art and they don't 
they don't help each other or an above yeah. and below they do help each other yeah actually i think this is an interesting one because i'm not sure that i would want to play scythe as much if either of those independent things was average but to me i i like the game i like just kind of the tight engine building and i i love the theme of this you know soviet farming plus mechs and yeah no the two really don't serve each other that well the theme doesn't really work with a tight euro engine builder maybe a tight engine builder is a better way to put it but i love both of them so i end up enjoying my experience every time i play a site yeah sushi go party is one that i find easy to play with lots of people because the sushi is cute and specifically like non-gamers are more willing to play a game with smiley face edamame than they are say seven wonders greek mythology cards Mm -hmm. shipwreck arcana is a little mathy puzzle game that we like that is just beautifully illustrated and that elevates it for me it barely Um, missed my list it might have been number 11 it was a very hard cut i love the art in that game yeah and it's just a simple little game but again that clean kind of white border um, that one evokes stained glass which is very nice yeah, and like stained glass type art really works, makes it pleasant. As well as the little, there are little wooden pieces or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I the numbers. Now. It's all very ple- It's all very well done. I love Spirit Island's tactileness. I, did that make your list, Mark? It did. In hindsight, I might have swapped it out for something. Yeah. That one might be biased um, just by how much I like the game. But if... If it was an average-looking fantasy game, I think I would still love it a lot. You know, top ten. It would still be in my top ten, so I don't think the yeah, art is what's I think, affecting I think it that a, much. But the art is very, very good. Yeah, that's a great point. I, th- I, think, I think you're right on that. I adore the art. And, and go back to our conversation with Eric Rouse. Did I say that right? I believe it's Royce. Okay. If you're listening, Eric, I be- at least I apologize for possibly mispronouncing your name in that podcast because I heard another podcast later where someone pronounced it Royce, and I believe I said Roos. I don't know. Sorry. Yeah, that, <laughs> I that, feel really the, bad. The artwork in Spirit Island and uh, the little flavor text is just absolutely brilliant. But you're right. The game itself stands on its own and probably could have worked with a generic fantasy setting. So maybe it doesn't actually meet the criteria for this. I actually put Spirit Island down and then took it off for exactly that reason. Because mm-hmm. yeah. I do like the art. And now that I think about it, uh, uh, the cards are what really stand out to me. I think the the board is is good, but it's not outstanding. I love uh, the board. I, I know you do. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah. and again, I'm not here to criticize any part of Spirit Island because I adore the game, but in terms of the aesthetic, I think the the names of things and the the card art is kind of the most um, notable part of that game mm-hmm. for me. Yeah. Um, and, and I eventually, and I was doing this quickly, but I took it off my list because I didn't think it quite fit the criteria. Mm-hmm. You have one more on your list, Matt. Yeah, Patchwork. That's one where actually I, I don't love the game, but it's nice, and it's just one of those ga- games that's kind of simple and kind of has this novel presentation theme uh, that just perfectly matches the mechanics. You know, you're actually trying to fit kind of odd and end pieces on the grid, and it works perfectly that they're little pieces of quilt. Like, you actually might make a quilt in a similar way. Mm-hmm. Um I almost uh, had a different Uwe game on my list. It was on my long list, and it got trimmed at some point. That'd be Noosefjord. Really? I, I, you love that game so much. I don't... I mean, I gave it, I think, an 8 out of 10, but I love the art in that game. It it evokes that kind of, like, sunny, windswept, oceanside feeling so well. I don't know. There's something about I it. I really it like looking at it. It doesn't quite do it for me in the same way. Oh, I don't think it does it for most people in the same way, but... I think it's a good I game, I keep but... looking up at it on the shelf, and I'm like, man, I want to look... I want to open the box and just look at the game. I mean, I want to open the box and play the game. Well, that too, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not like, oh man, I love the art on this, and I just want to look at the little fish pieces and the grizzled elders and whatever else. Yeah, I don't know. That one. That one's got a weird hold on me. 
Orion, let's talk about your your shortlist here. Yeah, so I I'm a little surprised that some of these didn't show up on anyone else's. But first one, Netrunner, Mark. Where is this? Where's Netrunner? I thought it I, it was on my long list. Okay. I thought about it, and it's not the art that does it. It's the the it's the setting itself. Yeah, that so, I appreciate more. Okay, so I think in Netrunner, God, there's so many good parts of this game. I you might get more out of it because you. I'm more of a computer person yeah. than you are, and I've read Neuromancer, and it really just evokes that. I, I don't have the right word. Experience is the right word, but cohesive setting. I don't know the whole thing. <laughs> Here's what took it off my list. I thought about it, and I realized the little short stories they ship with the the expansions. Yeah, I enjoy just as much as the art. Hmm. Okay. It, like that brings me into the world. I'm like, no, it's it's really the setting that I enjoy a lot. It's not necessarily looking at the cards themselves. Although the art's very nice. In I love the the mind space it creates. If that's yeah, a yeah, thing. no, that makes sense. Um, and I think I like kind of the I don't know. I love everything about that. It's I I, I think it's both a great game <laughs> and I love the experience of playing it. Mm-hmm. And I think the design works well to create exactly that atmosphere sure twilight imperium the greatest game (laughs) no um in terms of experience we've talked about this is almost always the top of our list when we talk about games that evoke a big experience and it's this epic you know all day affair that takes over your whole table and there's pieces everywhere and there's a bunch of stuff and then you've got this all these different diverse races with huge backstories and you can really get into playing the, the space lines as the trade empire or, you know, being the, the turtles and just kind of hiding in your corner or, I don't know. I think there's so much room for that. And I think the design really helps that. And it really enhances the experience of playing out a grand space opera and creating history. Yeah, I agree. I think, it and was on, it was maybe probably I'm... on in the last couple of cuts I made. I think I cut it because like what it has going for it is the table presence and everything. Yeah. But the actual art and the backstories and all that they're great because they exist, not because they're necessarily compelling. Like none of the alien races are that compelling. It's all fairly standard fantasy. You have the nomads and you have the humans and the military people and the technology people and the mind net and the the bugs you know that answer to their queen and it's all very rote sci-fi so that kind of barely squeaked it off my list okay well yeah. anyways and uh you mentioned with shipwreck arcana matt how it kind of evoked a a stained glass well i put the actual stained glass game of sagrada yep <laughs> um just because it's uh it, it was beautiful to see and you're rolling these different colored dice and you're fitting them in to make a stained glass window and i just it's very nice it's, yeah. i really liked it and then the last one that i had is a uh, food chain magnet which again we've talked about this a bunch of that's times. a controversial pick controversial. it was on my short list though okay well i think it's hilarious and I love the the whole shtick of being like this weird 1950s town with way over pushy fast food companies that are putting billboards outside your yeah. window to force you to go buy food from them. You know what the great touch on that game is? The player aids being menus. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's wonderful. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure that doesn't work for everyone, but I really like that game and how it's the art style of it i would never i would never take that art style and say oh that's definitely my favorite art style but i think it fits that game so well Mm -hmm. and i love how it serves the setting and the theme and the the setup of that game yeah that that game wouldn't make my list just because while i love those little touches i agree i think it's hilarious i don't think that affects how much i want to play the game I don't know. The attraction to play that game is really that kind of brutal puzzle. The brutal market competition. (laughs) Yeah. Brutal market competition. That's why I want to play the game. And the fact that it's got this unique and hilarious theming is is wonderful, but doesn't really move the needle for me. 
Mm-hmm. The only game that we haven't mentioned on my list is Mechs vs. Minions. Oh, yeah, that's a good Speaking one. Speaking of overproduced games that don't get in the way, at least. <laughs> yes, that's uh, that's just an abundance. That's just... An overflowing of wealth. Yes, which I look forward to playing more. I did make a list of five games that were the, were the aesthetics actually decreased my view of the game. And this was a harder list to make, honestly. There aren't that many games. Like, a lot of people complain about Dominion. You know, Dominion, I don't even look at the art, honestly. It means nothing to me. It doesn't affect my perception of the game. Same with, like, Through the Ages, which is an attractive game, but it doesn't affect my experience of the game. I just kind of ignore it. These games, actively, I don't want to play them as much as I would if they were just fine. Uh, So, starting off, two games that just look really boring. Both in space, Eminent Domain and The Expanse. They're just completely dull and there are other games that do similar things that look nicer and are are more interesting and don't like if you're gonna make a space game like you got to do something to like space is black with like white dots on it like you got to make something more interesting than that and those games don't really do that okay so uh, i sure i just yeah want to pull out something here in terms of mechanics or sorry excuse me mechanisms yeah to use your preferred term (laughs) and probably the correct term but whatever if you're being uh, a pedant, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I think you just reviewed SPQF. Yes. Which is very similar to Eminent Domain in the way that the cards work. Mm-hmm. But in terms of the aesthetic and the and the art is diametrically opposed. Yeah, SPQF looks very nice. There's some graphic design stuff that was annoying a bit with that game. Mm-hmm. But it looks very nice. The main thing, and they're very similar games, but I think I'll choose SPQF almost every time because it looks nicer and just because it's smaller to set up. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, uh, Eminent Domain's kind of a table hog. And then the Expanse, like, I wanted to like it a lot and I didn't, I have enjoyed my plays of it, but, like, they're two very similar games that are just more interesting to look at with El Grande and Dominant Species. I think the mechanisms are a bit better, but the Expanse isn't giving me anything with its art that makes me want to pull it out a lot. I already mentioned Rising Sun, at least on that one play, it was a hot mess and didn't want to make me play it ever again. It was just too much going on there. You mentioned Food Chain Magnate, which I think is very well done. Uh, Indonesia, also from Splatter. You played that one with us, right? I don't think so. Were you not there? Was this one of the several months I was out of the country? It might have been. It was the, when we went to the Vital Lacerda day and I we ended up playing that. not a Vital Lacerda game. No, I wasn't there for that. Uh, so Indonesia is abysmal. It actually looks pretty nice. It's a very intricate kind of map of Indonesia. The components given with the game literally do not fit on the board. Like, Indonesia is a collection of islands, and they're very thin and small, and the game divides them up into sections, and the components are these huge wooden pieces, and you're supposed to put, in some cases, a bunch of them on sections of the map that are literally smaller than the pieces like we substituted all of the non-map components out for other components literally to make the game playable it was a it was a mess the final one is sherlock holmes consulting detective which we don't have the newest printing we have the printing that doesn't have the worst of the typos or whatever but the main complaint with that one is the font that it is it's an atrocious the the font in that game which is 90% 90% reading text of that font is so hard to read. Yeah, no, I, I, I remember this now, but but when I saw that on your list, I, I was trying to think why exactly it would make the list because I didn't have the name. Yeah, because the map and the newspapers right. and stuff, all those parts are really cool. But the yeah, main. Yeah, yeah. And I've never actually read it, I've always been one of the people doing the other things. Yeah, I just designated myself as the reader. And I didn't really offer to share that because it's so annoying. The font's this incredibly thin, kind of wispy font. And, like, certain letters look the same. And if there's even, like, a smudge, it can screw it up. And it's, like, dark gray on this kind of medium brown background. It's just awful. You have to have very bright light to be able to read it well. And... Honestly, I want to play the game less because of that stupid font in the book. It's awful. Which is sad because it's such a fun game. It is a fun game. 
Maybe I hope they fix that with the new version. I know they did a new printing recently. Mm. Anyways, that's our list. I do want to do one honorable mention. That's Fire in the Lake, which made the short list because I honestly think that is a beautiful game. I don't know if the aesthetics actually change how I view the game, but in terms of like a map on a war game, that might be my favorite one. I, w- I actually wanted to bring up war games because I think it's another really good example of design created to serve the f- the function of the game. Mm-hmm. Yes. And almost entirely, at least in most cases, ignoring trying to be beautiful or trying to look attractive it's almost always well, trying... it's, just, it's a different when and they are beautiful like i would argue fire in the lake is i would argue twilight struggle has a very nice look it's a very utilitarian beauty yeah exactly it, it's a very utilitarian to serve the me- mechanisms of the game it's I, something I, I think yeah it's, i think it's interesting in that way i love looking at the games because i love looking at maps and studying wars and all that sort of stuff and I think if I didn't have, I guess you could say, a soft spot for maps and things like that, those design might be more off-putting or mm-hmm. might not help my enjoyment of the game. Yeah. But I love looking at a good map, so that puts a genre that I am already have a proclivity towards even higher in mm-hmm. my want, want to play. I believe our final topic we talked about are games that we wish that we would most like to see get a deluxe version or like a better art version, or yeah, I, that kind of thing. I have at least one that I can think of. You brought you you created this question, Matt. I'm curious what games you were thinking of. You know, I'm not sure if I have any on my list. You you I'm brought this sure. up. You don't have any. No, no. The ones that I've, I've kind of considered actually, I don't know that. Surely you'd say would... Castles of Burgundy, right? That's the classic okay. answer to this question. Yes, that that'll be my answer. Castles of Burgundy should have a nice, beautiful kind of whimsical castle theme, rather than just like puke yellow colors. That <laughs> is all I can see. Yeah, I mean, I think Sherlock Holmes. If they just made it function better, that'd be one for me. But actually, before I get to my number one, what do you you wouldn't want a kind of deluxified updated art updated look dominion map in terms of me playing it no i think I, I i don't know over time i've fallen in love with the dominion artwork and all that i think it's great i love the little touches you know maybe a couple cards like shanty town that get hate i wouldn't mind see, see redone it would be cool just in terms of having a revamped if, if they ever reboot dominion which I don't think they ever will. If they really made it beautiful in a way that would capture a wider audience, I would love that, but I don't think it would affect my play of the game. What are some other possibilities? Oh, what's the Euro game I mentioned earlier? Kalimala. Kalimala, yeah. I have a very high tolerance for dull-looking Euros. That might be the dullest <laughs> of looking Euros. Yeah. That one's I mean, it's, very it's a dry game to begin with, yeah. and then the art is even more dry i like it but i enjoy the game yeah but it's not an exciting aesthetic yeah all right you guys want to hear my number one? Oh, i i guess i'll just throw in here a game we've ragged on a lot for components is through the ages and there is a new version with cubes and it's way better but i don't have it because i already have the old one yeah but that's a game with cylinders that would be better with cubes and it you know, was made better with and cubes. And it was yeah. made with cubes, and it is better. There we go. It was already Yeah, the new version of Through the Ages is great. You know? My number one, I would love to see an updated deluxified version. It would overjoy me. Space Alert. Yeah, yeah. That was one of the ones I considered. I think Space Alert, I like. And we disagreed about this earlier, Mark. Yes, yes. We've, we've I, had this discussion. I like Space Alert a lot. I think it... I think the artwork is really funny and does what it needs to do, but you could clean it up and and make it look even better. Yeah, yeah, I I completely agree. I think you could do a lot of fun stuff with that, because especially because it has kind of a silly story and setting and theme and all that. You could make the look of it sillier. You could still play it straight. You could do. There's lots of flexibility if someone were to like redo the art on that game. And it wouldn't of, necessarily just be like an improved version of the same thing. They could really go wild with it. I can see that. 
I don't know. I love yeah. the giant A, B, C buttons in each room. Well, you can still have to have that. Completely, you know, absurd. I'd like to see a, an updated version of it just to see what they would do with it. You yeah. know, if they had the chance to redesign everything. Yeah. Th- there's nothing in particular that I want that I point to that like they they really should have done that better the yeah. first time around. But yeah, it'd be really fun to see a new version of that. I think Seven Wonders looks a hair dated. Yeah, by I, this I, point, I think that could. I don't think it needs it, but I think it could benefit from it. And I don't even think it looks bad. It just is is unmemorable in its presentation. That's about all I can think of, really. I think that's all the topics we had. It, what, what did we learn during this podcast? This seemed like a pretty pretty straightforward as in terms of our podcasts. Yeah, yeah. You promised kind of lots a... of tangents, Matt, and then we didn't get that many. We had a good one about buckets. <laughs> We did have the you, bucket tangent. We had the bucket tangent. Also, you were you were like hitting my tangents like three minutes before I wanted to bring them up. Oh, I was tangent sniping. Yeah, and sometimes it's... that you know that nips it in the bud where it could have been a ten minute rabbit hole. It, you know, you just kind of summarized it in thirty seconds. We're starting to think alike, Matt. We think alike. We knew that a long time ago. <laughs> I think honestly, all three of us are pretty lenient in terms of gamers for art and aesthetics and the look of our games we definitely uh, care more about the the play and the rules and the decisions of the game over the the art style but even you know, it, then it, it, in the a, cases here's an interesting tangent go ahead stop what you're talking about we're gonna tangent strap in <laughs> in in my journey as a board gamer i think i've become more jaded in terms of art and and certainly art and and theme and, and many games stand out and and i love their art and theme and that's a, a boon for the game but in general like a lot of the games we play if it's not exceptional you know whatever and i'm okay with that and i think I'll, i know that like some reviewers and just board gamers have the kind of a different journey where at a, at a certain point they just don't want to deal with sub excellent production you know yeah Um, i mean i don't mind mentioning it by name like shut up and sit down talks about that quite frequently it seems where they're like okay this game is very good but it looks ugly to us and there are so many other games that are both good and beautiful yeah and for me like maybe i'll get to that point maybe i'll get to the point And, and honestly that's great they have so many excellent games that they think are, are equally wonderful, that they can be picky like that. For me, if the game is truly incredible, that still stands out to me regardless of the look of it. Yeah. Um, I think it's kind of, for me, like the majority of games fall within like a 10% band of like the aesthetic plus or minus 10 points is the same. Yeah. And then there's a handful that are really outstanding. And then there's a couple that are really off-putting. Mm-hmm. And if it's not one of those third standard deviation sort of games, I'm not really thinking about the aesthetics. I might think about the theme, but the aesthetics is almost always going to be a secondary concern or tertiary concern. Yeah, I think I've become actually less jaded. I don't know if jaded is the right word, but I actually I think I care a bit more than I used to about that. But more so in the overall experience. So yeah. the art and the graphic design and the rule book and the narrative and the story and what the game is trying to do as a whole, when those things tie together very, very well, it makes me much more excited, I think, than I I would used to be. Maybe that's just because I've seen more excellent examples of that, um, that they now stand out a lot. On an only marginally related topic, uh, a couple years ago, I was doing much more front-end design in my web development job and i had read a book about design which was like designed for non-designers because i'm such a computer geek and just some basics about you should line up things and you should contrast things so that they stand out and things like that that anyone should know and at that time that was you know super revolutionary to me and then i started trying to pay attention to design of different websites and i went to 
conference in Boston that talked a good bit about design and how it serves different sorts of users and the different concerns that go into that. And I was much more, I don't know, trying to be aware and notice good design or bad design and be able to say why. And I think I have not paid as much attention to that sort of thing in the last couple of years. Hmm. But I, I always find it interesting to talk to designers because they are more concerned with how something looks and I am naturally more concerned with how something works. And I'm not trying to say one is better than the other. It's just a different viewpoint. And it's interesting to hear someone who approaches a topic from a different perspective. And I think in board game production, the artist and the graphic design are typically done by the same person. I, I think typically people who would say they're board game graphic designers are the same people who say they're artists. It's also usually divorced from the development of the game or the making of the game right divorce from the the design of the game. design the it, it is design. the main chunk of the development okay it's yeah. usually divorced from the design of and and sometimes that that's not always the case but in a lot of cases someone will design a game where they'll have a rule set and then they'll figure out the theme to apply to it and then change it to fit that i think that's less common but really from what i understand a lot of times the publisher will change the theme but typically almost always the designer's pitching the the game and has a prototype with a theme in mind and they'll do rudimentary stuff to make the game playable but a publisher isn't expecting art or completed design they're expecting something they can t they can play and get an understanding if right. it's good because because a lot of that is finishing touches right that's the development that's yeah. what the publisher is doing is you know they'll have in-house artists or artists they hire frequently or things like that who can who can do all that stuff, you know, hopefully in, in concert with the designer. Anyways, for all those listening, let me know what you think of game aesthetics or design or whatever you want to call it. If you have any games that you really either dislike or like or your perception of them changes based on the aesthetics of the game like the ones we've mentioned, I'd be very curious to see what those games are. Thanks for listening, everybody. Don't forget to check out thethoughtfulgamer.com. Check me out on Facebook and on Twitter. And if you would like to be one of the people chatting with us and listening and watching to our podcast recordings live, go to the uh, patreon.com slash thethoughtfulgamer. All support there through Patreon is greatly appreciated. It keeps us running and helps us keep doing cool things. Don't forget to rate and review the podcast and wherever you listen to podcasts. We will talk to you all again soon. Goodbye. Peace out. Good night.